Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Charlie Nemers, and I'm uh, here at the University of Missouri in Columbia, director of the Transportation Infrastructure Center. And really, what we're really proud to have as part of our uh, presentation this morning on railroad initiatives is some of the work that uh, Dr. Jim Noble really led and, and was really strong behind that was really one of our real great success stories in the work that we've done. And so we're really pleased that Jim will share with you uh, some of the work that we did on uh, rail freight passenger analysis in Missouri and, and how successful it was and why it worked. And, but, uh, so let me introduce Jim to you. Jim is a uh, faculty and a professor in the, area, in the School of uh, uh, Industrial Engineering and Systems Management. I, I get those back and forth, but uh, he's, uh, we work real closely with uh, the systems people in our business because much of what we do in transportation is systems oriented. So we're really close partnerships with that part of the college. Uh, in this case, we also work with others uh, from the private industry as well. So I'll give the phone over or the mic over to Jim. And uh, Jim, tell us a little bit too about Selfie at the sure. start too, so they know what that is. Sure. But uh, it's great that you're all with us, and Jim, it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's great to be able to uh, be here today and be able to share working on here in Missouri. Um, this particular project, is, as Charlie said, is not looking at freight and passenger uh, rail and how to improve those both. Uh, our team, uh, myself, uh, leading it with uh, Charlie, and then uh, several students there noted. Sean, Stella, and Andres. And uh, as he mentioned, we have a uh, IUCRC, NSF IUCRC called uh, Center for Excellence in uh, Logistics and Distribution. And CELDI is a consortium of uh, nine different universities scattered around the, the US. It uh, looks at logistics and transportation and distribution issues uh, ranging from the East Coast, we have Virginia Tech and uh, Clemson, and the West Coast, we have Cal Berkeley and Arizona. And then there's Missouri here in the Midwest and Arkansas, Oklahoma, and I probably forgot a few. Uh, but we, we do uh, applied research to solve problems, develop new tools to uh, address logistics problems that are out in industry. Uh, and then lastly, I mentioned that Phil uh, Borrowman from Hanson Wilson was a consultant that assisted us quickly. We started looking at, at rail uh, improvement alternatives. And so what is, is go through this and, and uh, our Overall agenda is only give you a, kind of a context that we saw ourselves at when we started addressing this problem, and then what our objective was in, in, in addressing it, and then uh, the, a little bit of the systems analysis background, and then get into the alternatives and how we analyze those, and then give you a little bit of the implementation story that's occurred over the last couple of years. So for starters, you know, we think about what's happened over the last 10 years in rail. Uh, there's been a, a, a very strong resurgence of uh, rail activity. Uh, you know, we see infrastructure expansion, as is noted in, in that particular uh, <clears throat> picture there. We see uh, a lot of efforts to try to make uh, rail much more energy efficient. Uh, or probably the, the, the driver for energy efficiency has also driven people to use rail more. Uh, that's resulted in a, a lot of intermodal growth uh, in terms of the need for uh, rail to be able to support that. And that all kind of comes together to look at some capacity issues. So I'm going to illustrate a few of those things a little bit further. First, we start thinking about fuel. Uh, we've, we've seen a, kind of a double spike over the last five or six years. We had in 08, we had that large spike in, in diesel. got almost up to $5 a gallon. Uh, then you know, we, we had a, a drop, and, but then it's gotten back up and kind of steadied off and kind of a little above $4 per gallon. So we have you know, historic highs in, in our fuel costs, which definitely drives uh, transportation to using rail and trying to, to reduce that and it's associated with transportation. I also, uh, particularly, you know, I note this a lot in our other research that we do, looking at logistics and the, the structure and the networks around that. If you look historically, uh, you know, we produce a lot of things in the US. And so there's a, a uh, production to the consumer, uh, those distances were shorter. And so that predominantly uh, necessitated, you know, you could do things with, with trucks. Uh, as we've seen things uh, change to more of a, a import model uh, in, in the US, that's dramatically impacted the, the kinds of facilities we need at, at the ports. It's dramatically impacted the, the rail infrastructure that's necessary and the intermodal 
uh, associated growth in containers that are associated with that. And so that is driving a lot of what we see in, in rail and, and the need for it. Uh, the intermodal uh, traffic, if we look at that, this is kind of just a, a graph reflecting that uh, over the last uh, 30 years. Uh, we, we've seen it grow a lot. You know, it, it peaked there in 2006. Uh, then we had, had the decline, the economy, economy decline that occurred in 08, 09, and, and 10. And then the resurgence now, we're getting back close to historic highs once again in our um, overall intermodal traffic areas. Uh, and so, you know, we're, when we start looking at the issues that are going to be associated with this project, these are, are drivers for that. Uh, when it, Along with the, just the intermodal uh, amount of traffic we can see here in the overall revenue ton miles, uh, pretty much the same graph, uh, just a little different time scale on it. Uh, so we have an increase in the, the revenue ton miles uh, up to uh, 2008, and we have that, 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 that peak or that dip, and then it recurring back to those same levels uh, here uh, in, in the most recent quarter. The graph down at the bottom right looks at here is we had this increase. And then we've had, we had a, a uh, reduction or a decline in the average line haul speeds. Uh, it went down uh, back, you know, up to the, the, the peak in 2000, 2008. Uh, we, it was down in kind of in this uh, 22 uh, miles per hour uh, average line haul speeds. Uh, as we saw the decrease in uh, revenue ton miles in 2009 and 10, then the line haul speeds go up because obviously if you have more capacity on on the line, then you don't have the congestion issues. Uh, but then as we see ourselves in this graph, uh, the data right now uh, is, doesn't go out current as I wish it did. But uh, the, the line's going back down you know, as we've had these uh, uh, rise in, in the overall utilization of the rail, putting the line haul speeds back down. The bottom line is we've got congestion uh, when we're operating uh, at our uh, economy's level. And as we look toward the future, that spells definite problems. I mean, if we look at right today, today being kind of in the last three or four years, um, we have some significant areas that are near or at capacity uh, around the United States. Uh, one of those being, and here we have Missouri right in the middle, and so this little line right here is one of the, the yellow line, is one that will we, uh, show up in our study uh, at being at near capacity. And then uh, system, uh, Cambridge Systematics projected in 2035 that there are no improvements made to the U.S. rail infrastructure. Uh, then you would have this massively red map, which would definitely cause a lot of problems uh, all around the U.S. in terms of that. And so this rail congestion is, is a big issue, which is somewhat the motivator behind this project. Uh, there's an article in the Kansas City Star done back in, in 08. Uh, looking at some of the data, uh, particularly related to passenger rail here in Missouri, and said it wasn't doing very well. Uh, you know, we have uh, extremely uh, poor performance. Uh, we have a loss in passengers. Um, we, uh, percentage basis, we had the highest loss. Uh, and so that was one of the motivators that, that drove this study. Is just look at okay, how can we look at this overall system and try to improve both the uh, the freight flow as well as the passenger uh, on time performance and service there. So here's our study objective, which I just basically said, uh, is to go through and look at the uh, Kansas City to St. Louis Union Pacific line and try to improve both the on time performance for passenger as well as the freight delay. We want both of those. And, and how can we come up with a list of those? Uh, over the course of time, they had been discussed quite a bit. And uh, MoDOT uh, engaged us to look at this and as kind of a third party to run an analysis uh, uh, and looking at the data and, and come up with some suggestions on how this could be done. So scope-wise, this is the uh, passenger rail service line that we're looking at between St. Louis and Kansas City. And uh, so and it's, and it's run by the, the, the blue line there is run by, by Union Pacific. Now, it's important to realize that that particular line is within the, a, a broader context. And so here's the broader context of the UP uh, system map. And so we're, we're talking basically about this area over in, in St. Louis to Kansas City, uh, which has passenger rail on it. 
And if we dive in a little bit further to it, we see that you know there's there's really kind of three legs here, and it's important to differentiate those because that really affects uh, what's going on in the situation. The blue line is what we call the, the Jefferson City subdivision between St. Louis and Jefferson City, and it's a double track uh, for the most part. Um, it's, it is now, but when we started to study, it was not double track all the way. It had, had a few little uh, spots that were not. But predominantly, it's a double track. Uh, the the black line is a single track as well as the yellow. And, and UP is running uh, their rail, basically the yellow line is, is eastbound, and the black line is westward bound. Uh, but when it comes down to Amtrak, Amtrak is on the black line only. So they're going with the flow when they go westward. When they're going eastward, they're going upstream against uh, freight on a single uh, uh, rail line. So as you can imagine, that causes some, some potential issues. And then it's a further component of this to think about is the fact that that particular link between Kansas City and St. Louis is part of the uh, high-speed rail quarter designation. So, it, and then we start looking at some of the improvements that are going to be done to it. Uh, there's been some federal uh, investment in that, uh, but that's the uh, was the original plan here from the USDOT. So that's kind of the context in terms of, of looking at this problem and where we're going. So let's start you know, a little, little time looking at the data and then look at some of the alternatives and analysis that we did on those alternatives. So the project started. It has two phases, I should say it up front. I had a 2006-2007 a phase that we did, and then I had a uh, 2009 phase uh, of analysis. And so uh, in 2006-07, we looked at the complete 2005 Amtrak data. And we're just trying to get some you know, feeling for what are the issues associated with that. So if we look at this, you see on the westbound line, so that's going to be going from St. Louis to Kansas City, you see uh, we have the Amtrak on time data. And so and we do, if you define on time being less than 30 minutes uh, late, then we see departing from St. Louis basically you know, kind of at a 90% level. Uh, so an average lateness of just five and a half minutes. But then as it goes from St. Louis to get to Jefferson City, then we, we leave, we're we leaving uh, St. Louis, or Jefferson City uh, significantly later uh, at this point in time. You know? So we, our on-time performance has dropped. Um, if we stick with the 70, uh, 30, 30 minutes, then we're at 70%. If we're doing 15, we're at 44%. Average lateness of around 30 minutes uh, overall. And so we, we're losing our on-time performance between St. Louis and Jefferson City as we're going westbound. Uh, once it gets on the uh, what we call the Sedalia subdivision, then it's it's a little bit lost, but it's more or less the same. Uh, it's it's able to flow with basically the the UP uh, trains that are on going westbound. So that's going to be important when we start looking at, at, at improvement possibilities. When we look at the eastbound, uh, we see the reverse, basically. So here we're, we're leaving Kansas City, going to St. Louis. Uh, we leave basically on time, and then, but by the time we get to Jefferson City, we, our on-time performance is at, at best 50%. Uh, and so it, it's quite poor. We've gone up to 42 minutes of delay uh, in that stretch. And so that obviously presents the opportunities uh, when we start thinking about the, the eastbound traffic. So we took that data and we started breaking it down. Where does all of these delays, where do, where do they actually occur? And so this uh, is the 2005 delay. We had a total of 107,000 minutes worth of delay associated with Amtrak uh, during that time period. And we can see where those delays occur. Uh, starting from, uh, let's start over from St. Louis. Uh, so we, we see a, a significant percentage of, oh, let me get that back. The green line, the green numbers are the delay associated with the line that occurs somewhere between the stations. Uh, the red numbers are the delay percentage of the overall delay that occurs at a given station. So because there are events that could happen that are station oriented. So we have a 12% of the overall delay between Washington and Kirkwood. We have Jefferson City, the, the Herman, 13%. We have the Sedalia, the Jefferson City, 16%. And then Lee Summit to Warrensburg, 19%. So we have you know, four or five different segments where we have significant delay occurring. And you know, that's a function of the schedule. That's a function of 
the infrastructure that's obviously there to support that. And that's what we're going to look at. Uh, we, we, we did a study, and just for completeness, I'll show you that picture as well, for 2008. And so in 2008, uh, there was a little bit more overall delay, 123,000 minutes. Uh, but the, the location of those delays are predominantly the same. Uh, you know, the, the, the amounts changed slightly uh, by, by around, but it uh, wasn't a significant change really in that regard. So the issues were, were basically the same. Uh, and when we look at the, the improvement alternatives that we recommended based upon the study in uh, 06 or 07, they were just starting to be implemented in 08 or 09. Um, so we wouldn't expect them to have affected anything yet. And we also look at okay, what kind of delays are actually occurring. Uh, there's a coding associated with that. So we have, here we have three different years worth of data. Uh, the um, uh, 05 and 08 are full years. The 09 is a partial part of the year. Uh, at that point in time. But we basically saw the same thing occur. Uh, the FDI, or the freight train interference, from the Amtrak perspective, uh, had the greatest percentage of the delay associated with that. So it's getting behind uh, either a coal train going one direction or an MT going the other way or whatever. Um, so that, that would be the biggest issues. Uh, then we see the uh, DSR coded, which is the temporary speed restrictions, as a significant portion of delays that are occurring as well. That's really our, our big, and then we finally have some passenger train interference. Uh, so Amtrak trains are actually interfering with each other a little bit uh, at, at stations and things like that. Uh, so you know, those, those, that's the issue. So, how, you know, so the issue is when we start looking at infrastructure improvements, how can we mitigate against those interferences? One thing that's interesting to note, and this is an 09 effect, is, and this is actually an encouraging delay to have. This NOD basically says you're delaying yourself because you're ahead of schedule. <laughs> and so that is actually the one delay that's okay uh, in, in the grand scheme. I mean, obviously, it's not, I mean, you prefer to have it perfect. But um, that's the one that is, uh, in 09, some things, one, you have a decrease in the overall freight load on, on the rail. And you also have some improvements that are starting to be uh, played out. And so you start having some uh, ahead of schedule delay uh, occurring. Okay, so from that, we took the, that data and we made this messy graph. <laughs> Actually, this, this graph is more uh, looking, uh, looking at all the issues. And so it's purposely messy because it, it reflects all the factors, well, many of the factors that go into how we have, how we, what the sources of the delay are. So uh, the theory constraints, which is an approach developed by Eli Goldratt, uh, it's looked at a lot, used a lot in, in uh, all kinds of different logistics kinds of domains and many different kind of problem solving scenarios. And so this is what we call a current reality tree, which is basically just an influence diagram of what's causing uh, issues. And so I spent a lot of time talking to people uh, within Amtrak, within Union Pacific, uh, and trying to figure out you know, what are the issues going on and then starting linking those together. So at the very top, we have two different delays. We have our Amtrak delay and our freight delay up on the right. And so then we start questioning, okay, what are the factors that are affecting that as you work your way down? And we have congestion issues, we have things being held in the sidings, things being held by dispatchers, um, we have equipment failures. I mean, there's a range of, of, of detailed things. But, you know, when we, we started working down to the issues that we saw as kind of more of the root causes, um, we see uh, well, the dispatcher priority issue could be, could be an issue uh, that, that was played out uh, in some of the scenarios we talked about. Uh, you could have crew scheduling in terms of a crew uh, goes dead, and so therefore you have to go in a train, a freight train is held until a crew can get to it. Uh, maintenance issues in terms of making sure that uh, the, the lines are good. Uh, the geographic conditions, which is really an interesting uh, component of it, is that between St. Louis and Jefferson City, you have rail that's running along the river. Well, as you think about that, it's a nice level area, but in general, uh, you have the infrastructure, you have a lot of water. And so when you're running heavy coal trains, those are going to tear up the rail a lot more than when you see the uh, uh, Jefferson City, uh, other places, just where, where you've got solid ground. Uh, so, so the geographic conditions actually increase the maintenance conditions that you have potentially, uh, which then cause the temporary speed restrictions, which then cause the congestion, which then cause the delays. So you start having this, this you know, cascading effect. And so the goal is to kind of try to break down all those different components that go into that. And at the core problem, uh, at that point, and this is, a, this is a good problem, but it's just the increased train load. You know, the more load you have uh, and you're running close to capacity, 
then your geographic conditions, you know, your, your uh, maintenance issues would be more, uh, your dispatching issues are more complex. So all of those things play out and make this a little bit more difficult problem to address. So that gave us a, just a, a, a broad picture to talk from to think through what are the issues. So from there, we started trying to generate uh, alternatives to improve the, the system. Uh, and these were worked in conjunction with the Union Pacific, with Amtrak, uh, together with Hanson Wilson, uh, and coming up with wh how would we go about addressing these uh, delays in the different places uh, in terms of the physical infrastructure improvement that could be done. So we see things you know, improving sidings. Actually, here we have a, a connecting two sidings, so actually just double tracking an area, uh, extending this another siding, uh, taking this, this bridge area. Well, like I said, from Kansas City down to Jefferson City, that's a single line. So we have some sidings, but many of them are too small to hold a freight train. Uh, so that would make the passenger trains would then have to use those when you had a, a meet event. Uh, on the Jefferson City to St. Louis side, you've got the, the bridge, uh, one bridge that was a single lane at Osage. And so that was one that uh, obviously you have a, a choke point there. Uh, at this point in time, you also have the Gasconade Bridge that uh, only had um, a single line over it. You had two bridges there that were single, uh, that would require congestion and relatively close to each other. Uh, you had a, a long stretch over here in this area between uh, that where you didn't have a crossover uh, on, on the double line. So particularly as trains are going in and out of St. Louis, there's a uh, need to be able to have more flexibility for that. So those are the alternatives in general that we, we highlighted and came up with, uh, together with Hanson, some uh, cost estimates, and then did some analysis on those. So just briefly looking at some of the alternatives, we remembered a bunch, but we have multiple ones for each one. But just kind of, you know, here's an example of the California siding, where, you know, we have this, this small siding already that's just 3,500 feet, so it's not long enough to put a train in. Uh, so we extended, you know, we had different options of how to extend it, whether to extend it east or west, or whether we'd move it totally. Uh, and uh, this is one that actually ended up being implemented. Uh, I may not mention that, but I guess it already did. Uh, so we tried to find a spot where we had the least number of crossings uh, in terms of putting those, those new sightings in. Uh, example of Strasburg, trying to extend it to a little bit to the left um, and to make that one a, a more usable. Uh, here's one where we're connecting. So this is a long stretch here. Uh, so we're basically adding seven miles uh, or six, seven miles worth of, of train to make this a, a double track area, which is a, it's, it's actually an area where a lot of the uh, passenger and freight trains would meet. And so uh, here's the, the, uh, the river bridge. So it was basically a matter of going in on the Osage and adding in the extra line, uh, making it that, so that would fit. Uh, this one actually required the, the bridge structure in order to support that, versus the, the Gasconade bridge was actually set up so it was already ready for the second line, but it was not installed yet at this point in time. So those are some of, I think I made one more alternative. And then the last one would be the Webster crossover. And so it had a single crossover, but it wasn't universal. Uh, so taking that one out and putting in one at Webster, uh, so that would be uh, another uh, improvement area. So we took all of those possible solution uh, or, or ideas, and we developed a large-scale simulation model for this. Uh, there's different kinds of simulation ways to simulate things. Um, this particular simulation is a it's a discrete event simulation that we we developed from scratch. The capture of the rail logic. Uh, so it was a fairly significant endeavor uh, to to come up with one that uh, addresses all the congestion issues. So you don't have trains running into each other. Uh, and keeping separations and all that kind of thing, uh, but doing it at a, uh, a medium-high level, so we're, we're we're capturing the congestion issues, but we're not modeling you know all of the direct physics logic of, of trains, which uh, some of the other simulations out there uh, address. So uh, we we had to model both the uh, here we have the dual track and here here's an example you can see where the, the bridge is not there. This is the gas cage out there, um, or the uh, Osage. Uh, then you've got the set different various sightings as they're going across. And then here's the, the uh, eastbound, which is not, doesn't have passenger rail, but it does have the, um, 
the freight rail that's going to join in at Jeff City and go on to St. Louis. So we, we modeled the whole thing from, from both from the yards in both St. Louis to Kansas City. Uh, once, if I animated this, I guess maybe I should do that at some point, uh, I can run it for you, but, it, but you see trains running back and forth uh, in this. And so we can simulate um, a month's worth of activity in a couple minutes uh, in this way. And so then we can go in and make modifications to the, the infrastructure and, and see how that would impact things. So the main thing we're looking at is, is congestion. Uh, where do we have delays? And so we, we find those delay points. And then from there, we would uh, come up with um, the, the, the data to show whether that's one that's it's significant enough that it needs to be addressed. So running the simulation back in 2007 for those scenarios, what we did is we looked at the amount of delay reduction that would occur from a, a given infrastructure improvement. And so we used as our baseline, if we went through and double tracked the whole thing, um, you know, that would be our best scenario. <laughs> uh, very expensive scenario, but we could, you know, that would be, uh, that would be the, the best scenario. Uh, so we said that's the baseline, because uh, you, you may still have delay in that, just because of timing events, you, you, you may still have delay uh, that could occur based upon the various stations and loadings and things. And so, but that's our base scenario. And then we looked at how much of that delay, of that best, you know, you have the current scenario versus the base. How much of that can we re recover by putting a given uh, investment in? So we look at uh, extending the California siding, which, and these are all organized by the Sedalia subdivision, which is between uh, Kansas City and, and Jefferson City. So, you know, that, we see the percentage of, of reduction in delay that can occur. And what we see that's a little bit interesting is that as we look at the, the, uh, the Sedalia side, the most delays, reduction in delay, occurred predominantly on the Amtrak side. That's where the savings occurred. Uh, so we have you know, three times the amount of savings here for, for the California siding. Uh, a significant amount if we increase that, that, that siding there. Uh, then we did some, combi some combinations of those. If we go down to the Jefferson City subdivision, we see the reverse occur. Uh, that the improvement alternatives for uh, on the Jefferson City subdivision predominantly were in the uh, for Union Pacific and on the freight trail, freight ra uh, rail. So that was uh, helpful when we start looking at uh, recommendations because uh, the, the uh, MoDOT was the one, the Amtrak was the perspective of, of where should we put uh, public money and where should private money go relative to the needs and, and the, uh, the uh, things that need to be done to improve overall service. So we took those numbers combined with the cost to implement them and put them on a dominance kind of frontier curve, which I think is useful to, to be able to see what's going on. So uh, sort them out. So here you basically have an example for, for, for the Union Pacific uh, percentage delays. Uh, if we just that was, would be the one column here, so it's taking these these percentage delays and then mapping those together with the cost to do those and find out which ones dominate. So, for example, this J4, which is extending California and I'm sorry, wrong one. J4 is the Webster crossover, and so here we get a 20% reduction in delay at a cost of I don't know three three or so uh, million. And so all these other alternatives in here, you're getting less delay and paying more money. So effectively, they're dominated out of consideration. It's not until you get up to J3, which is doing both of the bridges, that you find that you are uh, getting more overall delay reduction uh, relative to the cost. Um, and that's not to say that some of these in between, you know, this is, this is, these are kind of up on this edge. But I think it's a useful way to look at things from a uh, where are you getting the efficiency out of the, your investment. So we did the same thing for Amtrak uh, delay percentages, and so here we see the extending of California siding gave you know, the large the dominant solution relative to the cost, and then down to uh, the siding and connecting, uh, making the extra track basically was the next dominant solution. Everything else fell out kind of below those. 
So that helps give us insight in terms of where we want to put the, um, our, our resources. And then we finally looked at uh, kind of the amount of delay per uh, investment. So kind of a benefit cost ratio, basically, uh, on this. Of how much delay you get per million dollars invested. And so when we look at those, uh, we've got the, the percentages. Uh, this, this, this is a ratio. It's not a percentage. So, so here we're getting basically close to 4% of delay savings per million dollars are invested uh, for extending us from the Amtrak perspective of about 1.5 from the UP perspective. So these end up being you know, our economically efficient options. So we have kind of the dominant solutions and they're economic efficient. And so we can combine those two together to come up with our final recommendations. And so we recommended extending the California siding to connecting the two ones. Uh, actually, the, this one was on the edge of things, but the, uh, the main line on the Osage Bridge is a, is a major constraint. So we did uh, look at that. The, uh, the Gasconade Bridge was actually we kept it in the analysis, but it was actually being worked on while we started the analysis. And so uh, uh, it was already working on so we, we took that one out. Uh, and then we also thought that when it came down to it, this is kind of looking back to the uh, current reality tree, that there were some possible maintenance uh, scheduling things that could be addressed that could Im improve uh, both areas. So the result of that in 2007 was that the, uh, the bill was sent uh, to the, uh, actually we, we made it this, a similar presentation to the House Transportation Committee in Missouri. Uh, the bill was sent through, $5 million was allocated to basically uh, to the California siding. Uh, the federal match was secured and then in um, it was April of 2008 or 9, look at my notes just remember, somewhere in that range, the um, California, was, they broke, broke the ground and, and, and they went ahead and put that siding in. Uh, in, in, uh, at that point, point in time. Then we reset and did a little bit more analysis. Now I'll do this relatively quickly because it's, it's very similar. Uh, you know, we, we look at some other scenarios. MoDOT was interested in looking, uh, or Amtrak was looking at some other possible scenarios uh, together with UP in terms of how we can improve things. Uh, at this point in time we basically have uh, a pool of federal funding that's coming down that could be looked at. So we analyzed a couple different scenarios. We looked at, you know, really, you look at the, the, the locations of things. They're kind of the same scenarios. We have uh, a new siding over here. At least I went to Warrensburg. You know, we could look at uh, some enhancement speed things we could do. Uh, we have another one, another siding. We already did the California siding, which is kind of right in this area between Jefferson and Sedalia. There's another one over here at Knobnoster to look at to try to address that area. Uh, the bridge yet. Had not, uh, this bridge had not been implemented yet, so we still kept that on the table. We have another crossover for Herman, you know, a Kirkwood crossover, and so uh, we have some different areas to look at. So we ran the same simulation model again based upon these scenarios, and we, we start looking at what, what happened here. Once again, we saw some very similar kinds of results. Um, you know, we have the knob notcher siding once again, you know, which is on the Sedalia side, giving a greater percentage to Amtrak. Um, we look at um, you know, the, the bridges uh, are giving more overall benefit and in, in, in the in things on the uh, Jefferson City subdivision more to the, uh, the freight and so you know we have those overall uh, numbers uh, we didn't we did the same thing based upon uh, the percent delay reductions to the dominance graphs so once again, we see here we have a crossover that's dominant, followed by basically the river, the bridges, uh, the bridge three, and then the combination of the crossover and the bridge. So those obviously are, are pretty high on the freight side. On the passenger side, we have once we have the uh, Kirkwood crossover actually is, is a, a low cost one down here. But then we have this Knobmaster signing, which is one that's kind of back over on the uh, Sedalia side, and then we have some combinations. And then this final high cost but high return possible scenario is this track control increasing, uh, trying to improve the speed. And so then when we look at that, we do the same thing, do the benefit cost of the amount of savings 
per uh, million dollars uh, spent. Uh, so we see the, the siding and the crossover. Um, the bridge here is going to be relatively low because it's a high cost. Uh, but again, we still put that one kind of on our recommendations um, because it's, it just kind of completes things uh, to finish that all up uh, on the uh, uh, Jefferson City subdivision. So you know, I recommend you know, the, the Nadnoster siding, the Kingsville siding, and then getting that bridge done uh, over there, and then getting that crossover. Um, so those are the ones that came down as the recommendations for, for the, the revised study and the Herman. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll flip with those. Then, then these came forward. And so what's happened since there, and implementation-wise, uh, the Osage River Bridge became, uh, began the construction this spring. And so it'll be done uh, relatively soon. Um, this press release you know, acknowledges the fact that we, we did some study on this to help them, uh, help kind of determine where to put um, uh, capacity improvements. We, if you look at the Federal Railroads, um, their high-speed uh, rail program for Missouri. And so these are a list of things that are currently on that, that were, were funded uh, out of predominantly out of the uh, American Recovery and Re Reinvestment Act, uh, all of them in this case, that I've listed. And of those, uh, you know, those six of the uh, nine or ten, nine different uh, projects there are all ones that uh, we had studied and recommended. So like the, here's the bridge over the Osage River, so it had basically full funding to get that implemented. Uh, a lot of these other ones are, are uh, feasibility engineering studies to get that engineering part of the work done. And then uh, the implementation would be obviously uh, pending, uh, and that'll probably be in the next issue. So, in conclusion, this is a little fuzzy, but I'll zoom in a little bit. Uh, Murdoch put together kind of an overall state of what happened uh, to the system, and so there are things that are being done to try to improve things. You know, a fair amount of investment. You know, in over three million dollars, uh, three hundred million dollars has been invested, uh, and looking at this. Uh, and we look at the, the, the results. It is basically we've got you know, ridership that has been increasing. And I looked at 2012, just kind of its current. And it's, up, it's slightly ahead of this as well. Uh, On-time performance is, went from 08 of 63% up to 89%. That includes you know, some of the recommendations that have been implemented. Uh, customer satisfaction had gone up. Significantly, um, uh, it was not good before, and so that was a, a significant improvement. Uh, so you know, you know, from the overall you know, uh, the passenger side, we're seeing some significant improvements that have occurred uh, over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, and, the, and the challenge will be, as you know, this this occurred during a time period when freight was low, and uh, so obviously that that makes the passenger easier to do. Uh, so, but um, with the challenge will be as we, we, we are increasing and get our, our freight levels back to where they were, uh, is to maintain that. Uh, I think we've got the infrastructure that's starting to be implemented that just enable that. So uh, that concludes, and uh, from there I'll take questions. Jim, can you share with us the volume of the two-way freight rail on that line? You talked about two Amtrak trains a day. Yeah. Well, how many freight trains a day? Are there? In the 50 range. Yeah. 50. You know, kind of the 45 to 60 uh, trains per day. So uh, once we improve the capacity, then we'll see more freight trains and take advantage of that, and we'll come up with a stall position. That's a lot of oh, a new spot. How <laughs> congestion? At some point, you'll have to have an extra line. You can only tweak, squeeze so much out of. A, <laughs> uh, the rock, but uh, yeah. Okay, Dr. Willa asks, how do you model the priority between Amtrak and freight trains in the simulation? Uh, we, we, I mean, following kind of the, the national rule, uh, if the uh, passenger rail was given top priority uh, on that. And then we went through and used UP's rules uh, for their various freight, because uh, they had some expedites versus 
other uh, kinds of uh, trains. And so we, we were following their rules. Uh, so when we, and we were looking, in this case, uh, my memory here, uh, two or three uh, kind of decision nodes down to determine who would have priority and who would end up going into uh, the sightings. Now, the case we were going, uh, particularly on the Jefferson City uh, to Kansas City level, before we had the sightings big enough for uh, uh, the freight to be able to use them, then the, the passenger trains, even though they officially had priority, they had no space. So they had to go into the siding and wait for uh, the larger freight train to go by. And a question from the University of Iowa. Does passenger service have priori priority over freight train have priority over freight and track usage? And, and the answer is yes. I mean, kind of like along the lines of that last question. So yes, uh, the, the passenger does have the, the, the priority uh, by the, the federal mandate. There. And so uh, UP dispatchers work real hard to, to maintain that. But when, you don't have, when the infrastructure is not there to support it, then there's only so much you can do. And you can't, uh, for example, if you had a train that was coming, you know, once it leaves Kansas City, um, and it's uh, going along, and you have trains that have left Jefferson City going westbound, they're freight, uh, you know, you, the, the freight, the, the passengers don't have to go into the, the siding until the sidings are big enough to handle the, the freight, which is what the California one allowed. And then the ones that they have proposed uh, will allow that as well. We have multiple points for passing. OK, we also have another one. You mentioned the near capacity or above capacity. How do you get the capacity? Um, I should go back to that. Let me do that real quick. Uh, it'll be somewhere in there. Um, these capacities, uh, uh, the Cambridge Systematics generated those, um, and so I will defer. <laughs> uh, I don't 100 percent know uh, in terms of I mean, when you look at uh, what's going on. But you, you look at the capacity once you get to the point where you start having you know too much congestion. Um, uh, you know, in general, you know, if these speeds, you know, the average speeds being in the 20, the 22, 23 miles per hour in the line speeds. Uh, and you start have, seeing that de de degrade too much, and obviously you're you're getting to point at your capacities there. Um, it's it's there's just you know the the freight the, the train interactions uh, when you start looking at them. Uh, you you'd think you know I mean, almost if you have a, a, a freight train every half hour, that's getting uh, that's a lot of train uh, freight on a single line. Uh, because of the, you do have mandated uh, separation between trains that you have to have because of the, the speed, how it takes them, the time it takes them to slow down. And so, you know, it's basically, if you, you can look at the line fill amount, and, and once it gets beyond that, then you're going to start having those, those uh, congestion points. Do you have any plans to expand your simulation model to do crew scheduling, et cetera? The, um, have not been asked to do that, but I mean that would be definitely something that we could be easy factor to bring into it uh, to add basically additional resources that keep the trains live. Uh, so it would be uh, uh, actually it would be a very uh, simple addition. Um, uh, not all additions are simple, but that one <laughs> that one could be done fairly easy to, to do that. So, uh, um, but if we, you know that would be a good one to do, particularly as we look at uh, having more freight on the line there. Uh, like we'll the crew scheduling problem becomes a much more significant. Um, I'm trying to remember the percentage of crew uh, moving forward here, almost there. Um, I have to look at my cheat sheet to you know which of those codes stands for crew delays. Um, not finding it. Uh, 
off the top. So that could actually be the freight train interference could include that as well. But that's a good that's a good thing to add. Yeah, sorry. Is there a disincentive for UP in this case to increase sightings that would benefit passenger service over freight? Very really good point. I mean, particularly if we look back historically, there's one of these up. The, I mean, the, the, what our, our our objective was to say, how can we improve both? Because when we look at the results, there are benefits to both. Uh, and I think you know, if we look at actually, if I go down, um, kind of further down somewhere in this range. Uh, so here we have, you know, if we extend this California siding and the Strasburg siding, we're getting about the same improvement for both. Uh, that's not true on all of them. Um, but the, you know, the, the reality is, uh, I think my, my feeling is that they're, you know, they have to both be on the line. That's just kind of the, you know, we, we, the, the passenger is there, you know. If we go in Europe and things, you know, they have dedicated lines to passenger, but we don't find that in the U.S. very much. So they need to be on the same line. So putting the infrastructure in to support both is fundamentally, you know, going to end up moving both faster because uh, the passengers can passenger trains can slow down the freight as well as well as the freight slows down the passenger. So is there a disincentive? Um, you know, I. I I guess I would say that there's, you know, the key in this case was trying to find where it was a win-win for both. And I think we did that. In Missouri, some of the passengers, but most freight lines, uh, Springfield to St. Louis, uh, Kansas City to Omaha, a couple of them come to mind. Uh, what is MoDOT uh, or the uh, railroads looking to do to improve some of these other systems? And what role can we play that can support that? I know yeah, they've been exploring, particularly the uh, Kansas City or the St. Louis to uh, Springfield, and, and Amtrak did a preliminary study on that to show uh, the potentials. And that's a place where I think, in terms of looking, uh, as that potential goes further. I mean, that line has it's a single track line, so it has definitely a lot more need, uh, probably for some infrastructure improvement to, to bring that up to uh, ability to provide Amtrak service that would be acceptable. Uh, but there's definitely you know, on, all, on all of those lines, these you know, the models that we've developed uh, give you uh, the ability to to fairly quickly analyze, uh, quickly and robustly analyze uh, where the congestion points are and, and where it's the best place to put, you know, infrastructure improvements. We can move it anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Just once we have the data. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Kansas City, Omaha, uh, any of those it would be it could definitely be remodeled as well. Because that's a that's a heavy freight line, uh, Kansas City. 